it's our 25th anniversary. There's been a number of surprises along the way, but probably the biggest surprise for me has been the nature of the organization I've come to lead. On one hand, we're an investment firm, six or seven different platforms, real estate, credit, impact investing, growth. On the other hand, we're a bit of a new age conglomerate, over 200 country, companies in 29 countries, uh, 12 sectors. If you added them all up, it'd be about $160 billion of revenue. And on the third hand, we're essentially a research organization. Every year, we look at thousands of companies write tens of thousands of pages of research we call investment memos to make a few investments each year. So if you think about this ecosystem, essentially what it's evolved into is a front seat in the ongoing ebbs and flows of business. So what Jason and the team have asked me to do today is kind of look into that ecosystem and see what it's telling me about the year ahead. If I had to give you one word, one big word, it's change. Never have I seen the level, the breadth, the depth of change. But what's probably most interesting about it is the nature of the change is much different than I expected. I got out of business school, I hate to date myself, in 1986. The number one word was Kaizen. It's all about Japanese, the word for continuous improvement. And it was really a Darwinian view of business, a little bit better every day. But those of you who have followed evolutionary biology, if you have, note that Darwin has been proved to be just a little bit wrong. What Darwin said about continuous and constant change has been replaced by a, a theory with Eldridge and Gould, which is essentially the view that life goes along sort of in an equilibrium, and then from time to time is disturbed with rapid change, only to find another equilibrium. So 95% of all species are found in 5% of the fossil record. One day we have dinosaurs, the next day they're gone. So Gould and Eldridge see change to look like this. The term they use is punctuated equilibrium. And as I look into our portfolio, what I'm seeing is not the Kaizen change that I expected, but instead across a broad range, this type of dynamic. Let me give it to you for the music business. For decades, music business was economically about dropping an album led by a number of radio and record companies. Went through a period of time where it was unclear what was gonna happen, Sirius, Pandora, et cetera. And we've now moved into a new equilibrium where we're led by streaming, who would have called it? Spotify. And the economic drop is a concert tour. And over and over again in industries around the world, we're seeing these moments of punctuated equilibrium where status quo for decades, whether it be in retail, music, automobiles, are suddenly being upended. And this is the change that we're focused on. Why is it particularly important today? Uh, we're not a day-to-day -day market investor. We're sort of looking over the horizon. And so I don't know when the next recession is, but I know we're a day closer to it than yesterday. And as I think about where I want to invest, I don't want to buy the market. I don't want to buy beta. I'm looking for alpha. I'm looking for something that's away from the general market dynamics. And I want to buy growth, because if you think interest rates are going up and multiples are going down, the only way you're going to make money is if you grow through that dynamic. So where can you find alpha industry dynamics? And where can you find growth? And I think it's at these moments of punctuated equilibrium. It's industries that are undergoing change where that change will really overwhelm the general economic situation around it. And that's why we spend our time delving into these areas. So what I did today is I brought, we got about 20 or 30 of these we keep track of, but I brought eight ones we've been working on recently. We're only gonna have time to probably do three to four of these. And uh, rather than kind of give you a long death march of slides, I decided I'd let Jason choose what he wanted to talk about. And uh, he'll choose two or three. And Jason, what should we kick off on? Let's start with uh, education. Education. Um, the promise of education investing, I think, has been long unfulfilled. It's been extraordinarily frustrating to invest in education. The first investment I made, second investment I made, was actually in a textbook publisher in 1987. And so I've watched this for a long time. And one of the reasons that it's been incredibly frustrating is 
the educational models move extraordinarily slowly. Business model evolution is glacial. Uh, first business model was basically Plato at the foot of Socrates, great model, doesn't scale. Next business model, you basically, to get education, you had to be celibate and live in a monastery copying documents. Anything called the Dark Ages is not going to get a lot of consumer acceptance. We then moved to basically taking the words and putting them through a printing press, which allowed them to spread. But the delivery method was still massively ineffective. Tutors came and lived with you. Oxford and Cambridge topped out with one-on-one -on -one teaching. It just didn't scale. There was then a moment in the mid-1800s that totally corresponded to the Industrial Revolution, where we came up with the idea of the assembly line of education. We moved people first grade, second grade, third grade, down an assembly line in sequence. This was extraordinarily powerful. Why? Because for the first time, it cut costs in education to the point it could be broadly offered. Amazingly powerful model. It had just one major flaw. It had nothing to do with how we learn. The idea of fourth grade math is absurd if you have a fourth grader. They're not all at the same place. So it was good for efficiency. It was bad for efficacy. And we struggled with this model for over 150 years now. And the question is, as we're seeing business models all over the world change software, uh, 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 commerce of all sorts, is there a moment where the business model and delivery model of education is going to change? Now, it was a long way from the flip phone and the Palm Pilot to the iPhone. And it's been a long way from the Oregon Trail, the early educational software, to where we are today. But we're beginning to see the change occur. And an important driving piece of this, what made the smartphone work was essentially 3G. One of the issues for a long time in digital education is the schools weren't wired. It was massively expensive to wire schools. Uh, with some activities I was involved in, some government support, amazing progress in the last few years as we've moved the schools to 98% wired for broadband. This has allowed people to begin to deploy digital education in a way that didn't occur before. And it turned out the schools were paying about four times as much as the people next door to them. With a shiny little bit of light on that, the schools have been able to decrease their cost. So the market's now open. Uh, most people watching this don't see the progress yet, but let me unveil for you a little bit of why the acceleration is occurring. Everyone always looks at textbooks. Textbooks are probably the last thing that are going to move because of state adoption cycles. So we're only about 20% digitally uh, penetrated in textbooks. But what people miss is there is a larger market for assessment and basically supplementary, I think, worksheets. And that market has very rapidly begun to move digitally. And so what we have today is a really interesting evolving market map across a variety of different sectors with growth rates low in terms of total students, but high when you add in penetration. And figuring out and investing in this market map is one of the most interesting questions that we're seeing. At TPG, we've quietly uh, put together one of the largest portfolios of education investing, over a billion and a half dollars invested. We have schools that I was visiting last week in Morocco and Vietnam. Uh, we have 21 million students that were in with 25,000 schools in a company called Everfi. And to give you a sense of what we're seeing out there, one of my favorite companies, Dreambox Learning, uh, extraordinary CEO, Jesse Willie Wilson. Uh, it's a company that started as a B2C product and moved into the classroom. What it does is replace math worksheets, those old worksheets we all used to do. They do them online in a gamified way. What's cool about Dreambox is it's adaptive learning. They use AI to basically learn how the students learn. And then they change the programming going forward to reflect what the student needs. It would be as if you and I had textbooks and the words change just for us as you turn the page. Now think about this for a second. We can tell you through Netflix what movie you want to watch. Shouldn't we be able to tell students what lesson they need next? Mustn't we do that to really take advantage of the technology? And so looking forward, 
I find it absurd in some ways that we're still in the industrial revolution of education, that our kids walk around with backpacks this, the size of suitcases. And we're on the edge of a new era and a moment of punctuated equilibrium in education. Let's go to another one. All right, so let's lighten it up a little bit. Let's go weed. <laughs> I seldom get to talk about education and marijuana in the same, uh, in the same sequence. All right, so first of all, for the record, we're not invested anywhere in this industry. It's not clear, given who our investors are, that we can be or should be. But as well as being an investor, I am just fascinated with how industries evolve. I'm a student of industry evolution. And what's really interesting here is when we were investing in things like Airbnb or Spotify or Uber, one of the big discussions we'd have is how big of them is the market? Is there a market? This is one of the few examples I've ever seen of a, there's, there's absolute clarity there's a market. The market, uh, this is according I think to Cowan, is about the same size as the wine market even when it's illegal. We don't know how big it can be when it's legal. So if you think about this market, the question is, it's there. The answer is it's there, but the question is, what is this gonna look like? We have no idea what the structure of this market is gonna look like. So let me dive into it a little bit. First of all, how did we get there? Uh, if you go back to the 1930s, marijuana was a misdemeanor in 26 states and legal in the rest of the country. And one of the greatest pieces of political propaganda ever, there was a movie dropped by a religious group. They showed it around the country. It came to be known as Reefer Madness. I'm gonna play you a clip from it. It's really quite extraordinary film. These high school boys and girls are having a hop at the local soda fountain. Innocently, they dance. Innocent of a new and deadly menace lurking behind closed doors. Marijuana, the burning weed with its roots in hell. In this film, you will see the ease with which this vicious plant can be grown in your neighbor's yard, rolled into harmless looking cigarettes, hidden in an innocent shoe. This is an incredibly effective piece of, of uh, filmmaking because within a year there was a national regulation using almost the exact same words in the film that for the first time put regulation on marijuana. And if it went forward, it continued to get more and more regulated. In 1970, Nixon signed into a law that regulated at a higher level than meth, coke, or uh, fentanyl. But then moods began to change. And I think maybe these two presidential uh, moments capture it best. Uh, Clinton, I experimented, but I didn't inhale it. And Obama, with I inhaled it frequently, that was the point. <laughs> And today, I was really shocked by these numbers. Today, 65% of the population supports legalization, 85% supports, you can't get 65% of people to support anything. And so we've uh, begun to see a move towards medical marijuana, which over the period since 1996, when it started to today, is now in 46 of 50 states. And we've begun a process uh, on the legalization. I think we're in 10 states now. The first two were Colorado and Washington. Now, will it stop here? Uh, gambling is in 24 states. My personal view is it's unlikely to stop here if there's a recession. And if the other states get the realization that in California, they're going to collect 633 million of taxes this year. And in Washington, it's 320 million, I think. And it's substantially more than the taxes they collect on alcohol. So this is a big tax bucket waiting for people to jump on. So how is the industry gonna to come together? Let me take you through a quick look at some of the questions I would have and are, are totally unworked uh, out at this point. First of all, is it, you know, does, is it worth anything? Is, is it gonna scale? I wasn't sure it was gonna scale until I started to see the big players moving in. It's fascinating that Coca-Cola, a drink that started with cocaine, is now talking about a drink with marijuana. It's interesting that uh, Altria, realizing there's an opportunity, $4 billion from Constellation Brands. And the, que the question is whether this will be a fourth leg of a wine and spirits company in addition to a, uh, to a, a cigarette company. And we're running an experiment north of the border. As you know, in October 18, Canada legalized marijuana. That's an actual picture of the celebration. You wonder what all that smoke is. 
those of you who have followed it recently know that essentially there was a run on the on the system and they, they've been many states and, and provinces are, are out of marijuana today. They haven't been able to keep up with the demand. And it looks like by 2020 there will be more sales of marijuana than, the, than there is alcohol in Canada. Think about that. I didn't think anything would push Canadian beer aside. And the Canadian market has opened itself up to companies based in the US that want to float in Canada. So there's 40 plus companies that are on the Canadian Stock Exchange dealing with this industry. The uh, legendary one is Tilray. It went public in uh, July. It's currently a $14 billion market cap on, on $30 million of revenue. So we're having the cryptocurrency of, of, uh, of organics uh, going on north of the border. Then there's some really interesting questions about marketing. We don't even know what we're going to be marketing here. There's THC, there's CBD, there's different plants and strains. Is it going to be joints? Is it going to be brownies? I love this one, chicken wings, <laughs> munchies and, and weed together, gummies, et cetera. So you have to choose what the delivery system is. And then who are you going to market it for? The biggest surprise in my view is the data shows that it's not really a, a young kid's drug. It's not really about a high. It's actually about relaxation. So you're going to have to figure out, are you marketing to uh, Spicconi from Fast Times at Ridgemont to high, or is it a slightly more um, mature audience? So I want to share with you a pretty funny clip from uh, something called Uncut on YouTube that lays out some of the questions of how would you market this problem to, or this I was this a product. suburban housewife, and we had our cigarettes and our cocktails, and we were happy. No, I've never smoked marijuana before. We don't know what to do with that. Smooth. <laughs> I can feel some tingle in my brain. Can I feel you? like I'm smiling. Yeah. <laughs> when I do it, I really feel like the muscles here in my neck seem not as tight. And I see a lot of benefits for it. But, yeah. I totally lost track of what you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So we have to figure out how big it's going to be. We have to figure out whom we're going to market it to. And then we have an issue, which is the cash problem, which is today it's illegal to put uh, marijuana proceeds through the national banking system. So essentially, there's very few banks in the US that will hand it. And most of the companies, over 70% of the companies, are unbanked. So this is a cash business. How are you going to account for it at scale? How are you going to collect it? In Oregon, they're literally showing up to pay their taxes with duffel bags full of cash to, uh, to an armored building. And so it's giving rise to a series of industries to basically create payment systems for the industry. Dash is a, a cryptocurrency-based um, system that does a number of things, but it has shot up in valuation because it has the buzzword trifecta, mobile, cannabis, and blockchain. There's CM, CRMs and, and uh, customer management uh, systems, ERP systems for marijuana. So we've got an entire payment system to build. Then I think one of the most interesting areas is how is it going to be farmed? This is a $50 billion industry that grew up in dorm closets with grow lights in Humboldt County with, you know, in, in uh, clearings. And now what's going to happen now? It turns out that if you grow weed correctly, uh, you can do it with about 150% the efficiency in almost half the time. And uh, uh, the key element is electricity. So a Vertical farm for marijuana basically uses 16 times the energy of a data center. And 4% of the electricity in Denver right now is being used to grow marijuana. So the, the farming aspects of this are going to be interesting. And then how are you going to retail it? Uh, it's a big opportunity. By the best count we could get, there's about three times as many dispensaries now in Denver as there are Starbucks and McDonald's put together. But the rules are going to be complicated. This is a map of San Francisco. San Francisco law basically says you can't have a dispensary within 1,000 feet of any place kids are. So there's very few places in the city that you can actually have dispensaries, which of course gives rise, it has San Francisco, to the Uber for weed. And we're having a battle in San Francisco over the delivery system to your house between uh, speed weed and ease. There's billboards everywhere. They're burning huge amounts of cash to, to try to figure out who's going to win in this business. And of course, if there's a retail, there's an upper end. So there are tasting wheels for marijuana with standards being set. There is meal 
experiences pairing marijuana with various meals. And there is a brand new, I, I thought they were kidding me when our team found this, but there is a brand new uh, career that has been developed. And let me introduce you to Russ. Russ has always done things, including testing in his own way, and has even profiled his own method for testing the quality of the weed. This is what I'm passionate about, and so when I can see that somebody is also passionate because they've produced something like that looks like this, I can't wait. I can't wait to smoke this. Russ is a weed sommelier. Very unique. So for me, this is, uh, at the moment, just a, an academic exercise. I am fascinated in the year ahead to see how this market's going to develop. Let's go to another one. All right, why don't we try, we are at Bloomberg after all, Jim, so why don't we try data? Data. Uh, so hype sometimes gets ahead of reality. We talk about uh, autonomous vehicles well before they're, they're actually on the road. We've been talking about big data for a while, but it's gone now from hype to reality. And to be clear, it is big. It's extraordinary. It's hard to figure out. So let me give you the tagline that we're using to uh, solidify our thinking. Data is a new oil. We've been saying this for a couple of years. It's now being used more broadly. But let me kind of take you through how I'm thinking about the impact of data and where we are in the cycle. So oil and data have both been around forever. Uh, you know, the first well drilled was in 347 AD in China. Data is everything all the time. But what makes it a new era is our ability to gather it and refine it in huge volumes. When you have a new industry that's this important that shows up, what you get is early consolidation. In the early days of oil, we had massive consolidation. We're seeing massive consolidation in the world of data. You see titans created, Mellon, Getty, Rockefeller, uh, and the titans of today. And some interesting things happen. The industry gets shaped by spills and hacks. So the Exxon Valdez basically changed the regulation for oil. And what we're seeing is hacks changing the regulation for data around the world. Uh, both have had testimonies and scandals. When I watched Zuckerberg in front of the Senate, I flashed back to Ron Chernow's book Titan in 1907 when Rockefeller was in front of the courts. At that point, the Senate didn't have the ability to subpoena people. And they did not lay a glove on Rockefeller, just like they didn't lay a glove on Zuckerberg. And four years later, they broke up Standard Oil. And there are political scandals in the oil industry, the Teapot Dome, and obviously we're in the middle of one right now in the data world. Uh, and I think both oil and data are going to have a disproportionate effect on history. Why did Pearl Harbor happen? Because we cut off the oil supply to Japan. Why did Germany invade Russia when they shouldn't have because they needed the oil. And we're watching data shape the politics of the world. And the last point, this is the important one for me, is we tend to focus on the scale of the data. It's all about the products. So the oil industry basically was not about the oil itself. It was the products that it enabled. And what we're seeing today is companies, I, you know, is Google a search engine company? It really monetizes the data. Is Facebook a, you know, no, it's, it's a data company. So the idea of data products are going to dominate the years ahead. We're seeing it everywhere. I, I love this. It's also a new job opportunity. You know, in healthcare today, you can take your Fitbit data and get reductions on your healthcare premiums, which has created a whole new job type. There are people now who will take your Fitbit for a walk. <laughs> I've heard of dog walkers, but Fitbit walkers. Uh, you can now pay for things with data. So there are coffee shops. There's one outside of Bra uh, Brown where if, you will, if the students will give their information, they can get free coffee, and the information is then sold on to, uh, uh, to recruiters. JP Morgan uh, uses it in Japan, hired 40% of people through these data cafes. And around the world, you're paying for things with data. And I would argue that Facebook, Google, et cetera, these are not free services. You're just paying with a currency that is denominated more differently than, than, differently than you think. You are paying with data. And what is the value of the data? How much are you paying for those services? And do we know? Uh, around our portfolio, there's data everywhere. Spotify now partners with Ancestry, so you can figure out your Ancestry music and play it. 
Uh, we're doing uh, taxis in Seoul. We're doing, uh, we, we run the metering system here in, so across our companies, thousands of data products popping up. But as we begin to focus on data, the point I would say I'm thinking about a lot is there's a note of caution because society always catches up with a new technology. It often takes 50 years before we have an FAA. We don't have 50 years now. We're going to see society catch up pretty quickly. The question of technology and privacy has been around a long time. Interestingly enough, the core privacy laws in the US were written in response to the Kodak camera because the idea that someone could capture your picture and use it without you knowing was considered a privacy violation. And so there's a lot of interesting looming issues here, all of which we're going to have to figure out in the new world of data. So we keep at TPG just a landscape. These are all the companies we're tracking that are data industry oriented in different areas, et cetera. How are you going to sort that out? I'd give you just a single tagline. It's worth putting in the effort because data is a new oil. Maybe you have time for one more? So one more. All right, I, I kind of love influencers. Can we do influencers? Sure, we all do right. influencers. This is a short one. Uh, you know, one of the questions we constantly have in running an investment firm, and I constantly have, is how do you stay current? And one of the ways we do it is uh, once a month, I ask somebody around the firm from our junior ranks, say 25-year-old, to basically find a company or a trend that I'm not aware of and present it to the entire firm. And one of the interesting ones that caught my eye over the last year was when one of our associates stood up and said, here's a company you probably don't know much about, but it's one of the most interesting new age media companies out there. 11 years old, huge following, cosmetics, TV shows, launching businesses and everything from clothing to video games. It is, of course, the Kardashians. Chris, Chloe, uh, Kim, Courtney, Kendall, and Kylie. Also, well they. I'm sort of scared I could do that, right? <laughs> There's also the brother Rob. We don't hear a lot about Rob, but he's. Uh, and, and it's uh, whatever you think of the content or businesses, et cetera, this is an extraordinarily powerful engine. And what is the power that basically drives it? It's this concept of influencer. This is a relatively new thing. If you look over the past three or four years, there's been an extraordinary move towards influencers. Why is it? It's solving a problem. 77 cents of every additional advertising dollar is going to Google and Facebook. The advertisers are uncomfortable that they don't know where those ads are being placed. They want to get closer to the engagement of what their clients want to engage in. And the way to get there, it turns out, is through Instagram, which has become the platform of engagement. I didn't really see this coming. I remember when uh, Facebook bought it for a billion dollars. I thought it was a crazy number. It was one of the great steals of all time. We're up over a billion followers and just very extraordinary growth. But what I probably missed was the idea of it as a commerce platform. So these are the mega influencers. And this is where you see their Kardashians of three of the top 10. And I'm ranking them here by how much they get paid for one post. One post. And uh, why is that power there if you think about the youngest, Kylie Jenner, she's the youngest uh, self-made billionaire. She wiped out a billion three of Snapchat's value with one tweet saying she didn't think it was cool anymore. And that was the all-time leader, I think, until Elon Musk had about seven or 10 billion with his tweet. <laughs> if you think about why this is important, uh, you used to go to the Super Bowl to basically get engagement. This is the engagement, cost of, a, of a engagement for the Alexa ad you saw last year. But you could also hire Kim for $750,000 and basically get engagement at a substantially lower price, or the cutting edge of influencers, which are micro-influencers. And micro-influencers are very tiny uh, uh, storefronts, if you think of it, with about 30,000 followers. And by getting the data on who their followers are, you can create an extraordinary engagement level at an attractive price. Uh, what does a micro-engagement uh, engager uh, micro-influencer look like. This is a British couple that moved to New Zealand and now travels around the world posting Instagram pictures of themselves. They call themselves Kiwis off course. And if you look carefully, there's various hashtags and at signs which you can click through to buy the clothes that they're wearing in the picture. And they support their travel by basically being <laughs> micro-influencers. And they're everywhere. Uh, Gina, you may have read about in the 
Wall Street Journal, uh, she basically is a nine-year-old with a fashion sense. Her parents are hiring her a movie agent because his, you know, that's, that's her future. Loki, Loki is a Malamute. He has a billion, a million four followers. He represents Yakima, Mercedes, Volvo. His 30-year-old uh, owner uh, left his job and now manages Loki's Instagram full-time. Uh, Lil Michaela is a virtual influencer. So it's, she's created by a company backed by Sequoia called Brood, which uh, she's a cartoon. She has 1.4 million followers. She represents Balenciaga. And the great thing about, about Lily is she probably isn't going to have a scandal of some sort. So much easier to kind of bet on a, on a uh, virtual influencer than a real one. Uh, we're seeing this across our portfolio. If you have consumer products everywhere, you need to understand the potential for influencers. So we have a number of uh, cosmetic brands where influencers are extraordinarily important. We're investors in Anastasia, uh, an amazing brand out of Beverly Hills. Uh, it has 18 million Instagram followers. And the CEO personally curates the Instagram. That's how important it is to the business. Ipsy, we basically have a studio that allows our influencers to basically film themselves in order to sell our products. And at CAA, we're now using the idea of influencers in a new way. So at CAA, we have a massive data project where we basically scrape the web for all the following of our clients. And we scrape the web for the attributes of, our, of the customers of various clients or, or various products. And it allows us to basically do virtual matching. What influencer do you want for your product? What star do you want in your movie if you're trying to hit a certain demographic? So again, the concept of influencer and data coming together. So again, we keep these market maps. Uh, this is a term you may not have paid much attention for, but it's a burgeoning industry with an absolute moment of punctuated equilibrium going on. And if you want to understand consumer marketing going forward, understand influencers. Well, if I can go back here just to end up, uh, the year ahead is going to be an interesting one. I think the word is going to be change, but most importantly, it's going to be change of a certain sort, punctuated equilibrium. And I hope you'll find some to invest in the world ahead, and I hope all of you will have both an interesting conference and a great holiday. Thank you.